I know you've been sitting for a while. I'm going to ask you to stand and take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. We'll let you stretch for just a moment here. And I know that some of you are probably worried. You say, Dr. Rasmus said you're just getting up to speak. It's 14 minutes before 8. I told Pastor, I promised I'd be done before 10 after. I'll tell you what Henry VIII told all six of his wives. I won't keep you long. So you don't have to worry about that at all. Take your Bibles again, Genesis chapter 24. While you're standing and stretching for just a moment, let me give you a little background of the book of Genesis. Genesis is, in the words of probably the greatest one-volume commentator of the Bible, J. Sidlow Baxter, the seed plot for all the truths of the Bible. Uh, you could divide Genesis up into two parts. Genesis chapter 1 through 11 deals with the creation of man, the fall of man, redemption, the flood, the Tower of Babel. But then Genesis 12 through 50 really deals with the lives of four men. You have Abraham, the father of the faithful, a friend of God, amazing statement by itself. Book ending it here. And on the other end, you've got Joseph, chapters 37 through 50, with the exception of chapter 38, which deals with his brothers. So you've got Abraham and Joseph. In between, you have Isaac, just a few chapters. And you have Jacob, the duplicitous one, the deceiver, uh, the one who walked by sight rather than faith. And God gives us details of these people's lives so we can learn Sometimes to do some things and sometimes not to do some things. But bookended into the life of Isaac, and I, I wrote my first message, I think, at Isaac in my life last summer uh, when he was being go called to Mount Moriah. He followed his father, he followed by faith, he followed far, he followed without his friends, and he followed, he was faithful to work while he followed. Um, but we have a brief vignette that deals with the bride of Isaac. And that's what we're going to study tonight. We're going to look at the life just briefly tonight of Rebecca. And I believe that while God does not often shine the spotlight of scriptures on many women, there are exceptions. Hannah is one, Mary is another. Um, but there's not a lot. This is a brief picture that I believe every believer can learn from. So look with me, if you will, beginning in verse number 43. The Bible says this. And this is Eliezer talking, just to give you a brief background. This whole chapter is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. Uh, Eliezer shows us how to serve God. It's a long chapter, and he does about everything right in the whole chapter, except for one time he asked his master, Abraham, what if she won't be willing to come? Uh, Genesis 24, verse 5, and Abraham answers in verse 8, then thou shalt be clear from this thy oath. So I think God intended him to say that, because that's a great lesson to us for soul winning. We go, people don't get saved. That's okay. Because we're not responsible for results, only for obedience. Very important to remember that. Don't let that discourage you. It's our job to sow the seed. Some will fall on stony ground, some on thorny ground, some on shallow ground, but some seed will fall on good ground. So you know what? Let's just keep reaching in our pocket and sowing some seed. Maybe we'll get another Bud Calvert. Wouldn't that be great? I'm thankful that somebody gave my dad a gospel track. He'd been to church twice in his life before he was 21. He took that track, kept reading over, and one day he got his knees as better and said, God... I'm putting my trust in you. And it changed everything. So here we go with the verse. Look, if you will, verse number 43. Behold, I stand by the will of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water, and I say to her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of thy pitcher to drink. And she say to me, Both drink thou, and I will also draw for thy camels. Let me stop and say this. That's a second mile Christian. He wasn't asking her to water the camels. I'll talk about that in just a moment. I put this on Twitter about a week ago. There's two roads that are never crowded. I live near L.A. I hate driving to the airport, and I fly about 50,000 miles a year. I'll get on a plane out of Fresno this week and fly to Nashville. I'll get on a plane to Nashville on Saturday and fly to Denver. I'll get on a plane in Denver and fly back to Fresno on Monday. I fly a lot. We've got couples retreats this year in Florida and New Jersey and North Carolina, just in the fall. I hate going to the airport. It's a nightmare. But can I tell you two roads that are never crowded? The high road and the second mile road. The high road and the second mile road. Second mile Christian right here with Rebecca. Moving on here. Verse 44. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. And before he had done speaking, in mine heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down unto the well and drew water. And I said to her, Let me drink, I pray thee. 
And she made haste and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. So I drank, and she made the camels drink also. And I asked her, and said, Whose daughter out there? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, who Milcah bare upon him unto him. And I put the earring up, upon her face and the bracelets upon her hands. And I bowed down my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, which had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter to his son. And now if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban of Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceeded from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee, bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you help me tonight. I believe this is the passage you wanted me to preach on. I pray it will be a help and encouragement. Lord, you know my desire is to honor you and to encourage the pastor and to edify the people. And I pray that this brief passage will teach us some things that I believe are highly emulatable, that we can copy. Things that Rebecca did that we could do as well. Some simple principles. Lord, I acknowledge tonight that I need your help. I don't want to do this by myself. We know that every good and perfect gift comes from above for the Father of lights, with whom is no variable to see the shadow of turning. So, Lord, I pray you'll speak to our hearts. And, Lord, I pray that we will not just be hearers of your word, but we will be doers as well. And, Lord, it's my final prayer tonight that maybe for our having been here, we might be a little bit closer to being the servants of God that you saved us to be. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. I thought it might be good if you get up and get a little stretch there, and I appreciate that. God did not save us to sit. God saved us to serve. And if we're going to be like the Lord Jesus Christ, we are going to look for ways to serve. The Scriptures say about the Lord that the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. It's good to be ministered unto. I'm moving a little bit slowly tonight. Yesterday I had 15 staples removed because I had my gallbladder out about a week ago. And uh, so my wife's been helping me a little bit. I don't think she's ever helped me lift my suitcase in the van. Well, we are packed to stay on the road until July the 29th. So my suitcase is full. I have eight sets of everything, okay? And, uh, but she helped me a little bit. I said, well, he told me not to lift anything over 15 pounds. And I happen to know from the airport uh, that that suitcase weighs 48 and a half pounds. It was nice to have a little help. We like to be served. Have you ever been to a really, really, really nice restaurant? I certainly didn't take myself there. But I have a friend who's a plastic surgeon. He lives in Beverly Hills. Who's, he's crippled. He has muscular dystrophy. He's in a wheelchair, but he can still do hair transplants. That's all he can do now. Um, but he, he asked me out to eat every month. I have not been out to eat with him this year. One time I took him out for pizza after an orchestra concert. I paid. But he's offered to take me to some amazing places, preacher. One is the, probably the most memorable is in the Beverly Hills Hotel. It's called Wolfgang Puck's The Cut. It's a steakhouse. He said, I want to take you out for steak. I said, I'm game. I don't really like to do it, I'll be honest with you, because when I go with him, it's an eight-hour endeavor. I have to go there, I have to get him in, I have to get a wheelchair. Uh, it's hard to get him in and out of a car. And then we go there, he eats a lot and he eats very slowly. He's not, he's not big, but he, he likes to eat for like three or four hours. He said, I want to take you to the best steakhouse I've ever been to. I said, let's do it. I have never tasted YU, Japanese YU beef, except once in my life it was there. It's $25 an ounce. So for a five-ounce filet, it was $125. I know that for the two of us, we didn't have a salad. We split one dessert. We had iced tea. We had two sides. I think we had potatoes and cream spinach. And we had a couple, and they got a, it was a New York tasting menu. It was three New York strips and that filet. For that meal, it was $450. Jeez. Exactly. 
My wife and I go to Outback and we split a steak and we're happy. You all know what I'm talking about? We get the 12 ounce, we split it, not evenly. I get eight, she gets four, right? And we're happy that we might get an extra salad. That's good. I said to him, that man got excited about that price. I said, this has got to be the most expensive meal you've ever had. He said, oh no. I'm thinking now, pray tell. There's a place called Urusawa. It's a sushi restaurant in Los Angeles. They only do 12 to 14 people a night, five nights a week. That's all they'll do. He said, I took a friend there for a graduation from medical school. He said, for the two of us, you can't get tap water. You have to buy a bottled water. A bottled water is $45. I haven't been there. Don't plan to go there. For the two of them, it was $1,100 for dinner. It's not the world I live in. Now, you say, why would you say all this type of situation? Can I say this? God has a plan for our life. And God wants us to serve. What I remember most about the Wolfgang Pucks the Cut, I do remember cutting through the filet with a fork. I didn't need a knife. That was just mind-boggling to me. But what I remember more than that was the service. We had two waiters just for our table. Just for our table. Of course, obviously, for two waiters, if the guy tipped 20%, I know I didn't pay for the meal. $450, do the math. It was a $90 tip. You understand what I'm saying? But what I remember, folks, the service was unbelievable. Every time we finished something, fresh silverware. If your glass was half empty, more iced tea. It was unbelievable. Can I say this? People remember good service. I've only eaten there once, and it had to be at least six or seven years ago. But I remember the service. Can I ask you this? Does the world know about your service to the Lord Jesus Christ? Do they know about your service to Him? Your service to the Lord, your service to the church? I've been very thankful for my wife the last two or three weeks. I've needed a little more help. First day I got out of the hospital, I had 15 staples, five stitches, I had a drainage tube coming out of me. I couldn't get out of the couch. One day, next day I was able to get up. She weighs 121 pounds. I weigh a little bit more than that. Last I waited about a week, about 265. I'm saying, you got to help me get up. I can't do it. And here she is trying to pull me up. I mean, that, that should have been on a video, like world's funniest home videos. But man, I thanked her. She had to change all those bandages on me. She kept helping me. She was serving me. You know, the Lord wants us to serve Him and serve other people. I think about the Lord, the Bible says about Him, He went about doing good. He went about doing good. Let's look briefly at this passage here and share some things. First of all, we see this in verse number 45 about Rebecca. She was working when the opportunity came. Rebecca came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder and she went down into the well and drew water. She was working. Some people are always waiting for a great opportunity. And Henry Ford says they don't recognize it because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. She was working when the opportunity came. She wasn't sitting at home eating grapes on the princess program. Right? She was doing something. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Can I ask you a question? I have no idea who the workers are in this church. I have no idea. You know, though, and more importantly, the Lord knows. You say, Dr. Rasmussen, I don't know what I could do. You ask your pastor, he'll find something for you to do. You ask your pastor, he'll find something for you to do. You say, whoo, I don't want to do that. <laughs> See, we don't want to serve. The average person likes to slip in at the, right before the service starts and slip out as soon as it gets over. Check it off, I've done it for the week. No. The church belongs to God. Brother Scheibach's been faithful here for a long time, and I respect him for it, but it's not his church. The church is made of a group of baptized body of believers. But ladies and gentlemen, the church is the Lord's. He purchased it with his own blood. It's the Lord's. The church is the Lord's. We need to realize that. We need to remember that. So how can we serve him? If the Lord was here, we'd say, boy, we want to do anything we could to help him. Where two or three are gathered together, he's there in the midst. So we see, first of all, the first principle, I, I love this, she was working when the opportunity came. 
working. When the Lord comes, will He find us working? If you ever thought, Pastor, it would be great if we were preaching or soul winning with the Lord with the trumpet sounded. That would be an awesome thing. Years ago, there was a song that had a great line, Will those who come behind us find us faithful? I like the words of that. It's challenged me. I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful. My dad is elderly. He turns 90 years of age in June. He's infirm. He can't get out of the house much. He walks with a walker. Uh, but I want to be faithful for my dad's sake, for the name he's given me. I want to be fa- faithful for my younger siblings. I'm the oldest of seven kids, six boys. I want to be found faithful. And part of being found faithful is being found serving. God did not save us to sit. He saved us to serve. The Bible says we are to be vessels fit for the master's use. A vessel that's being used. If you're like my family growing up, we had the good china. We don't really have that in our family. My wife does have some glasses I'm not supposed to use. They're not expensive, but they're big. They're awesome with the shy about because they fit in my cup holder. I like clear glasses. I guess grew up in a family with seven kids. I like to know the glass is clean. Can I have an amen? So I like clear glasses. I like one that'll hold a lot of water, a lot of iced tea. But if I take that outside of the house and she sees me, I'm in trouble. She says, those are for the company. I think she's got eight of them. Those are for the company. Can I say this? Don't save your life for the company. Let's use it for the Lord this week. Secondly, today, if you look down, if you will, look down to verse number 48. We see about her. She's willing to serve. It says this, he says, drink, my Lord. She hasted and let down her pitcher about her head and gave him drink. Verse 19, when she done give him drink, she said, I'll draw water for thy camels also. Can I say this, friends? How many have ever drawn up a bucket of water out of a well? I haven't done it frequently. I've done it a few times. It's not easy. I've often thought that some of these women who was drawing water every day, they had some big guns. You say, why is that? Usually the bucket they would bring up held five gallons. Five gallons is 40 pounds. To be exact, about 42 pounds. Oftentimes these wells would be 100, 120 feet deep. They got to crank that up, crank it up, crank it up. They take it out of that pot and pour it into their bucket. They carry it to wherever they're taking it to. They didn't have running water back then. If I'm having to draw water for my needs, I'm probably not thinking, hey, would I, can I give you some water too? She had a servant spirit. She was willing to serve others. Others, Lord, yes, others, let this my motto be. Help me to serve others so I could be like thee. Jesus served others. So we see she was willing to serve. But then I want to emphasize this. Thirdly, she was willing to go the second mile. She said, I will draw it also for thy camels. Can I give you a little background on camels? Maybe you're like me, you didn't know a lot about camels. I never had a camel for a pet. Camels can weigh up to 1,500 pounds. Camels can drink up to half of their weight in water. Half their weight, 750 pounds. That's why they can go across the desert for a long time. Know the humps in their back do not hold water. But they can hold a lot of water. They can drink a lot of water. Now think about that. Up to half their weight in water. They can go a long time between drinking without being dehydrated. So she said, I will draw water for thy camels. Now I'm going to go back and I'm not going to show you the verse, but it says this in about verse number 14. And he took ten camels of the camels of his master, for all the goods of the master were in his hand. So he had ten camels. She said, I'm going to give them water till they're done drinking. So let's say they were only on half full. Remember 750 gallons? 750 pounds? Think about that. So if you divide eight into 750, we'll round it up. So we've got roughly 90 gallons of water they could drink. If they're on half full, that means each of them could drink 45 gallons of water times 10. 450 gallons. Did anybody ever get those sparklets, bottles of water in your home before that hold five gallons? 
we drank those at our house. We grew up at a health food home. Obviously, I veered away from that, but we'd have to go outside. We have to take a rag, get the dust off it, pull that plastic top off, carry it on our shoulder, dump it into that container. There's a great possibility, a great possibility, if they were even on half full, she would have had to do that 90 times. But she didn't say, oh, this is going to be hard. No. She said, I'm willing to go the second mile. By the way, Eliezer was looking for a second mile lady. Someone who's willing to do more than the minimum. By the way, did it work out well for her? Oh, my goodness. She became, she became part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. It all started when she was working. It willing to go the second mile. My time was almost up. I told you I'd be done before 10 after, and I'm going to keep my word. The next thing we see is that she was blessed. Oh, my. <laughs> blessed. Look at verse 53. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, that's clothing, and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. Let me mention two things. If you're getting jewels of silver and jewels of gold and new clothing, I bet she's saying, I'm glad I watered those camels. <laughs> In our life, we will always say either I'm glad I did or I wish I had. You understand what I'm saying? But get this little thing too. She was the one who served. She's the one who went the second mile. But I love this thought. It was a blessing to her family. It was a blessing to her family. We see that in the same verse, he gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. Later on in verse 58, they said, they said to Rebecca, wilt thou go? And she said, I will go. And that changed everything for her. It changed her destiny, it changed her name, it changed her future. But it all started, ladies and gentlemen, back when she was working, when the opportunity came, back when she was willing to serve, back when she was willing to go the second mile. And I believe today, just like it was back in this day and time, 5,000 plus years ago, I believe with all my heart that God will bless the same things today. Will we be found faithful when He comes? Will we go the second mile? Or is church, come as you are, leave as you were, check it off. And by the way, I believe these are probably the servants out here in midweek service. I believe that. But I hope that maybe tonight as you pillow your head, you'll say, you know what? Those things that Rebecca did, that doesn't deal. I'm thankful for people who came from here. Brandon, Christine, uh, I think of Oscar. I think of others who've come and finished Bible college. She never went to Bible college. She didn't grow up in a preacher's home. She was just serving. She's willing to go the second mile. And God blessed her in a great way. Folks, we're coming into the summer. Oftentimes people say with the church, well, we're going to have a summer slump. I wonder if people were really willing to serve and go the second mile if there might not be a summer surge. I believe God would bless that. I've told the young people, I'm holding them accountable, Brother Shabbat, like to give out a track at least every day. Some days, obviously, I hope they do more than that. But I think we could all do that. What if everybody here one time a day invited somebody to the Lighthouse Baptist Church of Santa Maria? Can I say this? Where you sow an emphasis, you reap a harvest. I believe that with all my heart. Where you sow an emphasis, you reap a harvest. So can I challenge you today as we stand on the threshold of entering the summer, can I challenge you to say, you know what, Lord, help me to be like Rebecca. Help me to be a kind of person who, obviously in her life, so clearly, she is working. She's willing to serve and willing to go the second mile. Because I believe if we'll do those things that God will bless us. You say, I have to give to do that. Give it and shall be given to you. 
My friends, you cannot give God. And God wants to bless you. And God wants to use you. Let's pray tonight. Lord, I thank you for these friends being here tonight. I pray you'll bless them for coming out this midweek service. I pray you'll bless during this brief invitation time as the pianist comes to play. I'm going to ask you to stand your feet, if you would, please. The heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe God spoke to you. You might want to come to the altar and talk to him about whatever he talked to you about. Are you willing to serve him? Are you willing to go the second mile? Oh, it's not always easy. It's not always comfortable. But it's always the best. The choice is ours. All we have to do is say, I'm going to work at it. I'm going to work for the night is coming. Night cometh when no man can work. I want to serve. Be like Jesus who came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And finally, I'm going to go the second mile. If your brother asks you to go with a mile, the Bible says go with him twain. Be a midnight friend. Be a second mile friend. Brother Scheibach did that, but he's willing to come down and drive three and a half, four hours each way to help us out twice a week for eight weeks. He's being a midnight friend. I remember asking him, he said, I'd love to do that. I wonder what God wants you to do. One more stands and we're done. The song says, all to Jesus I surrender. Our time, our talent, our treasure. He's got a plan for our life. Dear Lord, I pray you bless the good folks here at Lighthouse Baptist Church. Those willing to come out in a midweek service, I pray you'll bless them for their faithfulness, for not forsaking the assembly of themselves together. I know some people had to work tonight, others may have been ill, but these folks were faithful. I pray you bless that. And Lord, I pray you help each of us to learn from the life of Rebecca and to seek to be the servants you saved us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor.